we got two things that day. We got a wire from the state of New York for $45.9 million and a phone call from the FBI. Ray Flemings, the man just two degrees of separation from any gatekeeper in the world. There are you know, three people in America with more money than the bottom 50% of Americans. Wealth is getting concentrated into so few hands that it becomes dangerous. So the more money you have, the fewer people you can trust, the more money you have, the harder it is for a person to look you in the eye and tell you the truth, just tell you things that you don't want to hear. We're playing by somebody else's scoreboard, right? Because I think unconsciously, somebody's told us this is what we need to do. And then we play to that scoreboard only too later in life to realize we played to the wrong scoreboard. In 2021, uh, kind of the worst things that I could ever imagine happening to me uh, all happened at once, like, you know, major, major life crisis. You told me one of the craziest stories I've ever heard the first time we met. We were driving back from dinner and sharing a car on our way to the hotel. And you talked to me about how you got some ventilators. I'm wondering if you can tell that story for everybody. The great ventilator chase of 2020. Um, on April 1st, I believe, 2020. Now, you've got to, to set the scene, the world is crazy. Um, if you remember at that time, Manhattan had uh, scores of refrigerator trucks, right? Because the the, the morgue system could even process the bodies, right? This is a very scary time. It's not, you know what I mean? It's just, this is peak unknown COVID, right? And no one knows where this thing is heading. And we get a call from Governor Cuomo's office. And the call was that the state of New York needed ventilator. So in my company, we uh, have a, a practice where we take on special projects, things which are incredibly difficult to do. Um, and some would people, say impossible. Some would say impossible. Things that are really, really hard, we'll get those phone calls. And uh, this was one of them. And so, you know, we got two things that day. We got a wire from the state of New York for $45.9 million and a phone call from the FBI. Uh, so at this time, you remember there was all these, you know, these crazy people who were essentially defrauding governments over medical supplies and PPE. And so the call from the FBI was basically to let you know, we're watching, <laughs> right? And so it's like, go out here and try to get these ventilators. And you're also under, you're being essentially watched by the FBI while this stuff is going on at the same time. And so uh, I think the task was we had 72 hours to get, I can't remember the exact math, but a, a couple of thousand ventilators, whatever the math worked out to be, and get them into Manhattan um, and to get them out of China. Well, there was a problem. It was never really public news but China had embargoed the distribution uh, or sale of ventilators to America. Um, they were kind of angered by the Kung flu comments and these other things. And they were like, no, no ventilators. And so the reason that the state of New York couldn't just go and buy them direct is for this reason, right? Um, now, these are life-saving instruments. You know, it sounds like we're setting up to you know, go and run drugs or something, right? We're literally just seeking ventilators. But at that moment in time, uh, those devices were the most valuable commodity on earth. You know, every hour it seemed like the price on these things was, you know, was going. So the week before we took that project on, I think the average price of those devices was less than $6,000. By the end of the 10 days or so that we worked on this project, the price reached nearly $400,000 for a ventilator. Right. Now, everybody needed one. Everybody wanted one. Governments were willing to pay kind of whatever it took to get them. Um, and whenever a thing is that valuable, it invites all sorts of criminal elements, fraud, you know, every crazy thing that you could ever want to have happen. So at the end of the day, um, it was a complete mess. We wound up hiring a medical device inspector locally in China or a group of them to basically run from warehouse to warehouse to make sure we weren't buying rocks in a box and sit on the ventilators physically and kind of tape them down as we, you know, as we found uh, different allotments of them. We made um, some arrangements to have them, you know, essentially, you know, brought into the United States uh, through essentially smuggled out of China. Um, and then only to find out that the state of New York ultimately did not want the ventilators. 
Um, I had no idea why and still, you know, kind of don't know why. I would note as a footnote that, you know, a year and a half or so ago, it came out that the, uh, you know, the, the state of New York had, had kind of falsified the, the death numbers from the nursing homes and things of that sort. Uh, but a very, very interesting experience to go get 2,000 ventilators in the middle of COVID and then have the ventilators turned down after doing the work. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's that story. That is one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. It, in a lot of ways, it relates to what you do now. You make the impossible sort of possible. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Miria is a community and concierge for people who are super successful. And in the course of, uh, you know, people come to us because they want um, enhanced access to um, relationships, people that they don't know, and to things that they want in their life. And we help them get those things. And um, I think all people want to feel special. Uh, certainly successful people want to feel special. And um, so accessing things that other folks can't readily get their hands on is at the heart of our business. Um, yeah. Is there a spectrum of sort of concierge services or uh, access? Uh, there is. Um, the easiest way to think about um, what we do is this five-step spectrum where to the left, things are simple and to the right, uh, they're difficult uh, to impossible. So one, two, three, four, five. On the left, um, think about anything that you can purchase on a web browser, right? So um, you want to rent a home to stay in when you go to LA. Well, there's Airbnb for that. You want to buy a ticket to Coachella, go to Coachella.com. You've got a VIP pass. Number two is hard. Um, these are things where maybe they're available online, but they're still difficult for you to get your hands on. Uh, so these would be things like booking a private jet. Yeah, you can book a private jet online, but it's so confusing and so much brain damage from a booking. Most people use a broker or a travel person to do it. Number three, we call off market. And so these are things that sellers want to sell, but they never list or make available on a website. These would be, you know, artist credentials to go see your favorite band and all sorts of other things that are never on public sale. Um, Category four would be stuff that's hard, walking the red carpet at the Met Gala or being on stage with your favorite artist, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, the fifth category are the impossible requests, like the ventilator chase or all of these other sorts of, of wild and interesting things that we get called on to do. What, what, what's another example of something on that extremely difficult, nearly impossible thing that you guys have pulled off? We had a client who was vacationing in Europe and he wanted armed private security. Um, in a nation that did not allow for armed private security. And so um, the only people who could carry a gun in that country were on duty military and on duty essentially federal police. Um, the client had uh, some security concerns. He was on vacation. And um, we essentially got uh, security, an exception made by the government to treat him like a diplomat. And uh, the president of the nation actually gave a member of his own, the equivalent of the Secret Service, of his own security detail to secure a private American citizen. I mean, the degree of difficulty on getting stuff like that done is, you know, kind of off the, off the chart. And what I, what I find fascinating about problems like this, because you're solving a problem effectively, is that they're not really, um, not really repeatable. Well... I mean, in those two instances, in the security, in the security instance, they are repeatable in the ventilator. Obviously, that was kind of a, a once in, in a lifetime, hopefully, um, you know, sort of global pandemic. Um, but a lot of what we do, our business is more repeatable than it seems. It's just not, um, it's not openly commoditizable. Can you expand on that a little? Yeah. So um, the secret of our business is that um, we're not just randomly going out trying to do an impossible thing for a random person with a lot of money. We're actually um, matchmaking. So we work very closely with our clients to understand them, to understand what they want, and to understand the value exchange. A lot of things are in that impossible number five category because people, um, they don't, it's about more than money. Um, they have certain non financial considerations like who is the buyer? And by understanding what the seller wants and how to make that happen, the levers, 
and by understanding out of all of our clients who the right clients are for that thing, we can make really unique things happen for them. Does wealth become hollow at some point or, or money, I guess, is a different way to word this. Does money become hollow at the point where you can go out and buy anything you want that's available for sale? Uh, I think it's, you know, money has, um, has been proven uh, to, you know, have some negative effects on people, right? We become, uh, the richer we become, we become insensitive. Um, wealth is also um, isolating. You know, the, the rich become very, very insular. Um, billionaire is becoming a dirty word. It's becoming a pejorative. You know, people, you know, are very, very concerned. And so, yeah, I think, you know, wealth can have several different um, effects on you. But we think that when people get to a point where they have everything that they want financially, they move kind of be out of this luxury mindset and into a place of, of what we call post-luxury where it's not necessarily about the nice thing. Um, it's about experiences. It's about connection. It's about people. And um, we're building an organization to help folks find other people of like mind. So in dealing with this subset of the population, is there a difference in your mind between being rich and being wealthy? There is. Um, I think that you know, every child, we grow up like, hey, I want to be successful. Your parents say, go be successful, right? And we, we chase success. Um, in our society, broadly speaking, we have made the definition of success how much money you have, right? And so, you know, that's led to, you know, work, 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 hustle culture, entrepreneurial culture. You see all the blogs, you see all the tweets. I'm, you know, I'm out there hustling, out there hustling. Got to make money, got to make money. But there is no end to that, right? And so you wind up in a scenario where, you have made it. You have a wealth event. You've got a hundred million dollars, but that's not enough because someone has five hundred million dollars. You become a billionaire, and that's not enough because somebody's got ten billion, and so forth and so on. There's an element of like happy if, right? Like happy when. I, I think of it as happy if and happy when. I'll be happy if I can get the promotion. I'll be happy if I reach. $10 million. I'll be happy when I get mm -hmm. to $20 million. And then at that point that you get there, your baseline for happiness just totally changes. And then all of a sudden you're looking forward. But there's a weird sort of element where I wonder if it's the same drive that got you to achieve those goals that is the same trigger that's got you looking forward to the next set of goals. I, I think there's something, uh, there's a, a great truth about that. I agree with you on that. So how do you think about rich versus wealthy? We think that we need to broaden the definition of, of what success looks like to be more holistic, to not just be money. And, you know, we are all uh, socially connected. Um, have you ever had Nicholas Christakis on as a guest? Yeah. Uh, yeah. He wrote a great book called Connected. Um, and, you know, we know that we can catch COVID. We were talking about it. Or we know we can catch flu, but. You know, he, uh, Nicholas is a, is a world-renowned academic and, and just great human. He's a sterling professor at Yale, and he's done all this fantastic research. And basically, um, you can also catch obesity. You can catch smoking. You can catch suicide, depression. You can also catch happiness. Uh, you can catch sadness. You know, all of these things. And so I think because society has kind of placed this ideal, go get rich is the number one thing thing and there is social contagion essentially right this idea has spread that we're chasing that thing and i believe if we broaden that definition if we if we set a more holistic example of what success could look like and what if the richest people in the world were also the nicest what if the richest people in the world were also the kindest what if the world's wealthiest humans were uh far and away disproportionately charitable not most charitable because they have the most money and giving away one or two or three, but far and away, massive percentages of their income. What sort of societal impact would that have? You know, right now, philanthropy, you know, if someone, if you went to, I imagine, school age children and asked them, uh, draw a picture, tell me what philanthropy looks like. They might draw or paint many pictures of what philanthropy looks like, but they wouldn't describe it as cool. Right. 
right? And making this idea of giving back and helping other people cool and sexy, that's really where I think we have to go with it. I like that approach. I think that that would be really good for society. As you were saying, sort of the hustle culture, it also had me thinking about how it relates to our connectedness through Instagram and Facebook and everything else where what we do is we work really hard to achieve these goals that we think we're playing by somebody else's scoreboard, right? Because I think unconsciously somebody's told us this is what we need to do. And then we play to that scoreboard only too later in life to realize we played to the wrong scoreboard. But because we're playing to that scoreboard, then we want to show people we're successful. Right. So we post the new car, we post the vacation, we post the, which causes unhappiness in other people too, because it used to be, you know, we were living on a street. And if somebody got a new car, you would know, but like, that's the extent of what you're exposed to. And now you're exposed to every vacation, every sort of car, all these people who the are- The best moments in everyone else's life. Right. And they're, they're not moments of people who are like you, right? Or just one level above you. They're moments of people who are, who are just well beyond the gap between, you know, rich and, and the money that you can afford and the things that you can afford is- you're not exposed to people that are like you anymore. Right. You're exposed to people who are very different than you. How do you think about that? Uh, I agree with you. Uh, that is part of the problem. Um, and I think you know all of the studies are pretty clear that it has a negative effect on a negative effect on people. Um, you know, it's a it's like a slot machine, right? Every time you you open your phone, you've got the notification and the the uncertain, you know, what you're going to see, it's addicting people to it. And, and I also think it gives a false impression. So even folks who are way wealthier than you are, they're still only posting the great moments of their life. Yeah. They're still humans. They've got crap moments in their lives, just like everyone else, but they're not posting that. Right. And so you're seeing this highlight reel of life. And so you're not just looking at economic inequality. You're also looking at, you know, kind of the best of the best of the best moments in anyone's life. And the supermajority of your life isn't like that. Well, the supermajority of all of our lives isn't like that. You but know, you're, you, you're, you're scrolling and all you're seeing are these is extraordinary over, moments right, right, in right, everybody right. else's life. Yeah. I th- and it weighs down on people, I think. How can it not? When I think of wealth versus rich, I think, you know, wealth has a language and it's not money. And that language is sort of um, connectedness, relationships, health. All of that to me goes into well, so does money if you have enough, right? And enough is how do you define enough? Well, you know, there's the great story, um, Kurt Vonnegut um, eulogized uh, Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch 22. Um, and in his eulogy, he told a story about he and Heller visiting a billionaire's island. You probably heard this in all the, the great literature you have behind the wall, but the, the story goes something like um, Vonnegut teases. Joseph Heller by saying, do you know that our billionaire host made more money today than you made in all the copies of Catch-22 you've ever sold since publication? And Heller said, yeah, I know that. But I have something that the billionaire will never have. And Vonnegut asked, what? And Heller says, enough. I have enough. And I think knowing, you know, that, that ties into this idea of innumeracy we were talking about earlier. And I was saying that I, I believe that people broadly don't understand the difference in large numbers. We don't have an intuitive grasp of what it means, you know, because, you know, what is that, a thousand books behind us or 500? You know, it's hard for me to just look at it at a glance and know. And when you get into really big numbers, millions and tens of millions and billions, we just can't, we can't process, process it. We can't intuit it. And, um, and that leads us to, to just not knowing what these things mean or not having a grasp of what it means. So sharing the difference between or developing an understanding around what is the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire is important. And I think the clearest example of that is to use time. Um, nearly all of us have, uh, have gotten a paycheck in our life. If you're paid biweekly, um, you spend a million seconds of your life every 12 and a half days. You spend a billion seconds of your life every... 32 years, roughly. So the difference between a million and a billion is the difference between a two-week paycheck and your entire career in time, right? right? 
if that's the difference between a million and a billion, and we're chasing 1 billion, 2 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion, 50 billion, 60, what is the point, right? Um, at some point, we need to be pushing those things further and further and helping people. I also love Warren Buffett's quote in his documentary. Um, you know, obviously, Warren's done incredible things, but he says, um, you know, they basically said, hey, Warren, you were, you were um, kind of famously not very charitable early in your career, right? Uh, why? And his response was along the lines of, well, I believe I could compound money as well as, as well or better than anybody in the world. And my goal was to grow the pot as big as I could possibly grow it and then give away the maximum amount when I was done. And the interviewer uh, says, uh, well, why did that change? And I said, well, it changed because I discovered that the problems of humanity are compounding faster than I can compound money. And uh, that led to him, you know, I think at this time he would be, has given away the largest percentage of his fortune during his lifetime than any other person uh, after, after realizing. That's a powerful sort of realization. One of the things is you were talking about millions and billions and how we lose the concept of what that means. We we also lose it in society. It's not just with um, people who have billions. It's when governments announce they're spending billions of dollars. It's just become sort of a million, right? right? Like we don't understand the context of what that is. I've often wondered why they don't do it per capita, and then that would explain to people in very relatable terms how much per person is being spent on X, Y, and Z. And I think that they don't do it because they. They actually know people don't grasp these concepts and we don't teach it in school. Right, 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 right. And I think part of the reason we don't teach them in schools is we, we have this sort of incentive where we don't want people to understand the difference between a million and a billion. You know, I would go a little further. I would actually say that it's not that we don't want people to understand. It's that we don't understand. And I'm meaning the big we, hmm. the, the, the so-called leaders. You know, there's this idea that there is this group of really smart people yeah. who have their hand on the wheel guiding the planet left or right or kind of, you know, making all of these decisions. I, I actually don't agree with that. I believe that the systems are too big. You know, if you ask me, and I know this is not a political show, the, the problem is not Trump or Biden. The problem is not Obama or Bush. The problem in America is with the presidency itself. You know, the, the idea of the presidency was developed so long ago. Well, hey, let's elect our king. Well, when the Constitution was ratified, a human being had never traveled faster than a horse could carry them. No human. The world was much smaller. It was easier to manage. So here we are saying, let's pick one person who can run our military and educate our children and run the economy and healthcare, and there, that person doesn't exist. There is no human being that smart who can do a good job on all of these things. It's, it's, it's far beyond their reach. And I think we've got to uh, recognize that the system is getting to a point where, where it doesn't make sense even to the people who are operating the system, right? So in, uh, in, in my business, uh, Silicon Valley Bank imploded. I'll give you an example. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank imploded and people woke up to this reality that, oh my goodness, a deposit in a bank is actually not a deposit. It's an unsecured loan to the bank. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Above 250K, right? <laughs> right? And so, so even that number, right? The FDIC, the FDIC has about $130 billion. And if everybody withdrew their money, it's, no, yeah. it's not even everybody. They've got 130 billion of insurance money. How much money do U.S. depositors have in U.S. Bank? Trillion. 20 trillion. Yeah. Right? So how's 130 billion dollars insuring 20 trillion dollars? It's not. Yeah. Right? It's a belief. The, the entire economic system, we think it sits on money. And people will sit there, these policy wonks, and they'll talk about numbers and blah, 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 and all these things. The economy is based on trust. Yeah. And when that trust breaks down, 
You see what you're seeing in our society today when the rich aren't trusting the poor and the whites aren't trusting the blacks and the Republicans aren't trusting. You begin to see this fraying of the edges, the, the things that you see in San Francisco right now with you know, all of the, these things going on. It's, it all actually sits on a lack of trust or an erosion of trust, this fraying of the American experiment. How do we rebuild trust? Well, so South Africa did something really interesting. Um, here was a, you know, a community, thanks to apartheid, which uh, there had been a lot of wrongs done. You could look at examples throughout history where, you know, when one group has been done wrong, if they come to power, they do the same things essentially to the other group that was done to them and back and forth and back and forth throughout human history. South Africa took a different approach. They instituted something called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And the basic idea was that if you, that apartheid was wrong and people were wrong, we've learned from it and we're going to do better as a nation. And if you committed a crime under apartheid, come forward, admit your crime, and apply for amnesty by admitting it. But if you didn't, and they could later prove mm. that you had committed the crime, then you could stand to account for it. So it was this encouraging this sort of day of reckoning around all of the historical wrongs. Yeah. A program to kind of make those things right and then move forward. So your question was, how do we start to restore that trust? So that's actually part of our, our mission at Miria. You know, when we say that the world's most successful people should be, um, you know, that we're a community and a concierge, we want them to be having more fun. We want them to be spending more money. And it sounds very snooty. It sounds very exclusive until you understand that we um, believe in inclusive exclusivity. Right. So success is not just money. So our members are not just rich. They're also people who are changing the world in many other walks of life. They're very great academics and accomplished business people and artists and uh, solving the economic problems. Uh, we need uh, to all kind of do our part in it. That goes back to, you know, what if the wealthiest people in the world were also the nicest? What if they also uh, were the most charitable? Well, if you're having fun in your life and you're enjoying your life and you're coming into contact with people and it's not insolent and it's more fun, you're seeing and kind of touching the problems, right? I mean, um, our primary service for our customers on the concierge side, of course, is human powered services and um, being nice to and tipping well and making sure the people who are serving you uh, are taken care of. It's a rounding error on the balance sheets for most of our clients. So why not do it? Right. Because when you really, really think about it, let's say you and I hit the jackpot, build a great business, or hit the lottery, whatever our, our path to success or money is. We have all the money we can dream of. We go and buy a $70 million G6. How many people have to wake up that morning so that my plane can take off? Lot. Somebody's got to fuel it. Somebody had to drive a truck to get it there. Somebody's got to be in that air traffic control town. Somebody's got to handle the baggage. You got to have pilots in the cockpit. And that's just here where you're taking off from. Somebody halfway around the world have to also get up and do the same thing. Well, those people who are getting up to fuel your plane, they have got to earn a living wage. Because at the point that they don't earn a living wage, then you have a problem. The whole system falls apart. Right. Then you see what you're seeing in America, the tent cities. You have people who are like, I've worked 60 hours this week and cannot eat and pay rent. Why am I working? Right. I worked a 60 hour work week in America and I am on public assistance. Why work at all? Right. It's, 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 and this goes back to the whole, there are, you know, three people in America with more money than the bottom 50% of Americans. Right. So, Wealth is getting concentrated into so few hands that it becomes dangerous. And you never know where it starts. You never know the moment of ignition. Think about uh, the Arab Spring and um, the forces which led to it had been underway for decades. Yeah. Right? All this upheaval and people were able to suppress it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One day, 
uh, a person whose name none of us will even remember his name. He had done everything society had told him. I think he had two degrees from great school. And he's there selling fruit at a fruit stand. And he's like, fuck it. He self-immolates. He sets himself on fire, which literally was the spark for the Arab Spring because it touched so many other people there who were like in this position of like, I don't trust these people. I don't trust this system. And so, um, Look, we think that there is, I'm an optimist. I want you to hear me loud and clear. I actually believe that you and I are having this conversation because at the end of the day, um, the universe bends towards positive and most people want to do the right thing. And sure, we've got a lot of crazy things that we need to address. And I just want to promote honest and open conversation around those things so that we can, so that we can get there the fun and interesting and, and happy way as opposed to the sort of you know, powder keg situations that I think being divisive and not talking openly about these things promotes. I wonder if we're gonna see a rise again in union as a means to sort of counteract this so people can get a living wage, so people can make a living, so people can thrive in society. I, I think you are already, right? I, I think, um, in the last uh, since COVID, you've seen uh, the largest uh, union levels and attempt to unionize in decades, right? So that's very much already underway in the United States. I want to come back to something we said earlier, and then um, which was trust and circles. And one of the things that we we've both noticed and talked about a little bit beforehand is how sometimes the wealthier you are the smaller your circle is mm -hmm. and not only is it smaller but it gets smaller every year yeah. it's really hard to get into that yeah. circle for an outsider can you talk to me about that and what you've seen and experienced right um so it starts really and truly with the successful person being focused right so great financial success you know um, and i'm not talking about heirs but but entrepreneurs people that are out there building businesses it takes a lot out of you Right. And we are all only given 24 hours a day. And if you've built some giant thing to give you a bunch of money, you've spent the majority of your time doing that thing. And so whatever that thing is, it's just like one vertical, one business. And so that in and of itself is um, is insular. Right. So you're focused on that thing. You're you're missing the kids ball games. You're not on the PTA board. You're at work. Right. So it kind of starts there. Um, having a bunch of money has some awesome parts to it, right? The more money you have, uh, the more stuff you can buy, the more places you can get, right? It, there's some cool parts to it. But then there are some downsides. Um, most things are directly related to money. <laughs> the more money you have, it's going up. But then a lot of the personal pieces are inversely related. So the more money you have, the fewer people you can trust, the more money you have, the harder it is for a person to look you in the eye and tell you the truth, just tell you things that you don't want to hear. And so that circle, to your point, just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And um, that is one of the things that we hope to correct with the community aspect of Myria um, in exposing people who are super successful to other interesting human beings that are doing amazing things. Contact theory, right? Just by, you know, by coming into contact with other Miriam members and the service people who make all the magic happen around the world for our clients, uh, we think it it helps everyone to, you know, to be more successful and happier ultimately. There's two things there that I, I want to dive into a little bit. One was the uh, often we become successful because we focused on one vertical. That vertical is usually money career success, we're climbing one ladder mm -hmm. at the exclusion of kids, family. And so it's interesting to me because we often look up to people and we're like, oh man, I wish I was this person. Mm -hmm. And then if you dove into it, you'd find out that they're an incredibly uh, unbalanced person. They have extreme strengths and extreme weaknesses. I mean, there's uh, more than a couple of billionaires that I'm sure we both know uh, in the United States that couldn't drive their kids to school if they had to because they don't know where their kids go to school. They don't know how to get there from their house. Yep. Uh, and so we look at this and we hold these people up and we, we think, oh, I want to be like that person. But we're picking 
one vertical out of that. We don't want to trade all of our problems for their problems. Right. Well, this is the, the whole um, changing the definition of success, changing what it looks like. Right. What does it mean? So uh, for, for us, if success is money, this goes back to that idea of the, the, uh, the Arab Spring person. He did what society told him to do. Yeah. Go get an education. Well, he didn't just get one degree. He got two. You know, you, you play by the rules. You do what you're told. And then the shock of your life, you don't, you don't have what you thought would be there. And so we're looking at success as money. Yeah. And even the rich are getting all of the money and are like, well, I thought happiness was here. Well, I, I thought community, you know, and it, it's just not. Because the definition was always wrong. You have to remember, like, um, all of these, these concepts, you know, we were talking about America's system of government um, or the, the presidency being an outdated concept. Even um, the economy. Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations the same year, 1776, that, the, that the, the America became a nation, right? Um, 250 some odd years ago. And um, the capitalism that Adam Smith articulated in Wealth of Nations is not the capitalism that we practice today. Uh, nowhere near it. Uh, in fact, uh, by today's definition, Adam Smith would be labeled a socialist or a communist if you actually read Adam Smith's quotes in the book. You know, he says the rich uh, should not be taxed in proportion to their income, but something more than. Right. I mean, there's all these yeah. these crazy sorts of sounding things like, oh, no, responsible capitalist would. But capitalism and democracy, all of these things are meant to serve the people and to hopefully make us happier and more productive and lead better lives. Um, I also don't believe in this idea of a, um, a James Bond supervillain. You know, pick whoever you think of as the worst billionaire in the world. Were they alive in 1776? No, they didn't invent capitalism. They were born into it, just like us. And if there's a problem with the game, if there's a problem with inequality, uh, then let's all work together to change the game that we all agreed to play instead of blaming the people who are playing it, right? Um, I, uh, I believe that they are us, right? We have this idea that like this conspiratorial sorts of thing, someone's got their hand on the wheel, but no one has their hand on the wheel. Do you think if we got rid of multi-generational wealth in the sense that you could accumulate as much as you want during your life but when you when you pass on it's a, it's it a, all goes away so it's a huge problem um like would that solve some of the problems it would solve, because then each sort of like yeah, cohort would, is starting from the it, same it would solve a ish. massive amount of the problems uh so would property records you know why do you own the land past your natural life hmm. So, um, you know, America obviously was settled. Um, there was a homesteading act and uh, the American government gave over 10% of the land of the United States uh, to people, mm -hmm. but not all people. Right. Um, that created the first inequality. It, it created the first inequality because wealth compounds yeah. and the nation has protected the property records. You know, a generation is between 10 and 25 years, 10 and, 10 and 30 years. Let's, let's kind of split the difference, call it 25. There's been about 10 generations in America. Um, for, from the foundation until 1978, if you were black in America, you could not fairly compound money. 202 years um, out of the 10 generations, right? So literally my son, and I'm not that old, is the first generation of you know, black folks in America that could actually begin compounding money in the way that other people were allowed to in the nation. Now, for nine generations before, from the founding of the country, uh, since, since we got there, right? Yeah. From the start until 1978, I was five years old when that occurred. And then specifically 1978, because uh, you had the Fair Housing Act and all of the associated lending protections to go in place. Um, and so it took literally that long, 1776 to 1978. Now, federal taxes started in 1913. 
So um, whatever that is, 65 years, African-Americans are paying federal taxes for benefits that they do not receive. And, uh, and it compounds this sort of wild inequality generation after generation after generation. And, and it's at the heart of eroding the trust, right? The end of the day, people want to go to work. They want to obey the rules of society. Mm -hmm. I paid my taxes. I've gone to school. I've done nothing wrong. I voted. Been a good person. I've been a good person. And there is nothing here for, you know, that system, you know, as it just keeps going, 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 uh, breaks down. Now, the founding fathers in their wisdom gave us a system voting to change it. I made that statistic earlier that uh, three people are richer than 165 million. Well, what is, what's the most votes ever cast in a U.S. federal election? 81 million votes. Literally, at the next federal election, if they so chose, those 165 million people could vote their way out of poverty. You could tax their way out of poverty unilaterally. But there's too much division in the nation. Um, there's no honest, fact-based conversations to talk about how we solve these problems. And it, it just leads to this sort of spiraling, 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 when does it end? You know, I would tell you that even my wealthiest clients don't like it. Right? So they played by the rules of the game. They succeeded. And... They want to change it, but no one person, even if one person said, hey, I'm a billionaire, here's a billion dollars, I'm going to leave it on a street corner yeah. in the poorest neighborhood in town, go run with it, right? Whoever wants it, it's all yours, you know. What's the, the U.S. federal budget? Yeah. <laughs> Trillions of dollars. That $1 billion is not going to address yeah. anything. I mean, sure, the people who, quote unquote, hit the lottery that day and, and found the money uh, would do better, but it, it won't fix anything systemically. This is why we believe. We've got to create groups of people who are having more fun, who are having these discussions, who are being inclusively exclusive. So, hey, I'm financially successful. Hey, I'm a great artist. Hey, I'm financially successful. Hey, I'm tops in music. Hey, you know, and bringing those people together, not in an accusatorial way, not in, a, in an agenda sort of way, but, um, but kind of moving society forward in that way. That's interesting because you, you don't just accept anybody. You have an onboarding process. Mm -hmm. uh, and through that process, you're getting to know each other. They're getting to know you. You're getting to know them. I'm wondering if you can go through some of the questions that you ask people. Uh, and I'm sure our audience would Absolutely. value going through these as well in terms of how do I get to know myself and where I'm at? Absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the, the great opportunities is to choose happiness today and to choose you know, a, a broader definition of what... Uh, of what we think of as success. So when we sit down with people, um, we send them a questionnaire. And the questionnaire includes a, a bunch of different sections. Um, there's a fun section. Because again, I believe if people are having more fun in their life, we're all human beings. Who doesn't want to enjoy their life, right? Like everyone wants to be having a good time, to feel good, to feel special, have a great time. And so there's all of the, uh, the bucket list questions, if you will, right? What's the stuff that you've done? What's the stuff that you've been wanting to do your whole life? You know, what are the things that you're curious about? Um, and then we get into more of the philosophical things. So if, imagine you're at your 80th birthday or whatever late life birthday you want it to be, uh, everyone you love is gathered around and they say, uh, they're going to toast you. What would those closest to you say about you? And now if that birthday party was held tonight, uh, what would they say about you today? And um, if there's a Delta, what do you want to do about it? If your doctor called you right now and was like, you know, you've got one year to live. What would you be doing anything different than you're doing today? And if so, why? <laughs> right. Um, and just really asking these sorts of probing questions. Who matters in your life? Talk to us about your community. And so it kind of starts at the me, you know, because we're all, you know, looking at ourselves. And then we try to broaden it to get our clients to kind of look outside of themselves and to start thinking about, um, obviously, their family first, then their community, 
and then kind of the broader issue. I think one of the interesting things that COVID did is it disconnected us from our community on mass. Uh, locked us in our yeah, house, uh, delivery services. We don't have to interact with people. We're not forced to see uh, people who are more or less successful than we are. We're not, we don't see the full spectrum of society. And mm -hmm. because we don't, we think the world looks a lot like us. Right. We become disconnected and selfish as a result of that. I think we were, I would, I agree with you, but I would say that the, the disconnectedness and the selfishness predate COVID, right? We've been- But it was like an amplifier. I felt it, like it was an amplifier. It, it definitely isolated us, no question. I would argue that you see it in music. There was a point in time where, let's say black music. Um, I'm old enough, and I'll probably get tarred and feathered for saying this, but I am old enough to remember how black people in America acted before hip hop. And I'm going to sound like a boomer. I, I already know, you know, people are going to be like, what? Um, Dr. Dre. Everybody can see Dr. Dre in their head. Well, before Dr. Dre was in a, you know, black ball cap, and, you know, the, the NWA look, Dr. Dre was in world class wrecking crew, you know, sequins jacket with long jerry curl, right? Like, it was a completely different thing, okay? When I'm the first hip-hop generation, there would be no such thing as hip-hop if my generation didn't like it. So it's not, I'm not criticizing hip-hop in any way. What I'm trying to say is, at that point in time, it was entertainment. And now it's become not entertainment. It's become lifestyle and culture for a lot of people. Mm. The music, even in early hip-hop, was we centric it was looking out at the world like and at some point that changed and all of the lyrics became me how much i've got how much money look at me 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 and you know that me centric thinking is i think closely related to how we define success right right all the money. I got the this, I got the car, I've got the, you know, me, 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 what I've got. And again, we are all connected. Yeah. We are not going to be able to ever create a society where we don't need each other. And if we could create it, who would want that? I don't want to live in some, you know, test tube without people. Right. And we've gotten very myopic, very narrowly viewed. And I, I see it reflected in culture, in music, in movies, um, et cetera, et cetera. We're all part of an ecosystem, right? We are and, a super organism, whether we know it or not. And, and this was interesting because during COVID, I mean, my kids actually used this against me to get what they wanted, which I thought was quite clever of them um, because I was teaching them like, well, we have to support small business, right? So we have to find a way to either order food or like go out <laughs> and get food. Even if we can't go in the restaurant, we'll like, and they were like, well, why? And I was like, well, because we're all part of an ecosystem. I run a business. They run a business. Yeah. We're all interconnected, right? Like, yeah. I can't really be successful if they're not successful. Yeah. I mean, I can financially, but I can't exist in the community and in a world where we're not all successful together. And so my, um, my oldest comes to me and he's like, I think we should just, we should make a rule to have croissants every day. And I was like, well, what do you mean? How, we how old have is your oldest? He was like. 10 at the time i, I think it. or 11 mine is 11 so I, I get i get it and i was like well what do you think will happen if we have croissants every day well he, and he's he's quite clever he's like well in france they eat croissants every day and like they seem pretty healthy they also drink an espresso should i give you an espresso i know and i was like okay and then he's like and you told us we need to support local businesses and so like, this box of cereal or you know whatever is not local and like croissants that's just down the road they're as smart as their papa oh my god and then we, of course we end up having croissants more often than we like it. because of that. But it was a clever sort of argument about that but awesome. yeah we're all part of the same system mm -hmm. and i do feel like you can't have one part of that system be so successful when other parts of the system aren't. Yeah. But it's about growing the pie, not dividing the pie, right? So how do we grow the pie for everybody instead of focus on the selfishness of sort of well, so how do we get the, mo the biggest piece for ourselves? That's one of the most amazing things about all of this stuff that we're discussing, right? So uh, I wrote this 
section in my upcoming book called the, the Cost of Stupidity. Stress from poverty and all of the crazy things that go on in America um, shortens the lifespan of African Americans. Blacks live 5.8 years less than white people in America. There's about 42 million black people in America. You multiply 5.8 years times 42 million, and you get a big number. Uh, 2.1 trillion um, hours of life. The Apollo space program, the moonshot, uh, there's actually an estimate. It was 5.2 billion man hours to put a man on the moon. And the benefits to society has changed telecommunications. There would be no SpaceX today without the Apollo program. Like, like think about all of the societal benefits from one moonshot. Then think about how much life is being wasted in America. 2.1 million, 2.1 trillion man hours. Divide that in half. We're wasting about 200 moonshots of, of human productivity. Being selfish. Not letting the lessons of the past change our future. And there is no telling where our society would be. We could tackle, you know, all of these great issues we keep talking about, but don't want to deal with in a meaningful way. Um, just by being more open and, and, and honest about these things. I want to come back to the questions that you asked just for a second. Yeah, me too. Sorry, I forgot. Is, is there one that stands out for you as like if I could only ask one question to get to know somebody yeah. and determine whether uh, this is a person I want to work with, what would that question what be? What do you want? That would be the question. And it's different for everyone. There is no right answer. right? So for every person, uh, for our clients, for every person who comes in, um, young, 20s or 30s, wealth event, single, ready to go have fun, meet people, party, whatever, we have a, a mid-career person with kids, the last thing they want to do is go party. They're trying to do fun stuff with their family. We have other people, late stage career, who are focused on wealth transfer, who are um, legacy, so forth and so on. There, there's no right answer to it, but if you ask the question, would we want to work with them? Uh, I think the what do you want um, is very, very helpful. Do you see answers change over time? Like with the, the people who are sort of like maybe near end of life, they're, do they think about their role in society and sort of things differently than people who are maybe mid-stage? It depends. Um, it depends on, on who. So um, we kind of over-index on people who are thinking socially, right. um, but we certainly know a bunch of folks who aren't. Um, so it really does depend. I mean, you've seen, we've seen some kind of late life changes of heart. Because we all, we all gain perspective. I mean, like the 40 year old me looks at my 16 year old self. I was like, on, boy. man, that guy was an idiot. But you know, my 60 year old self is going to look at me now and be like, yeah. man, that guy was yeah. an idiot. Yeah. 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 I think, uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm an optimist, right? When I look at the sort of folks that we're meeting, I think that the wealth, we get painted with this broad stroke, a, a caricature yeah. almost. But certainly some of our mutual friends are literally some of the nicest and most genial humans on this planet uh, who definitely care, who are definitely trying to get it right. None of us have this whole thing figured out. You know, we can sit here with all of our fancy words and our big talk and our learnings, but we really just don't know that much, right? I mean, right. humanity is, is frankly not that smart, right? I mean, when you think about uh, AI, so here we've created a machine that can run on your phone that knows everything every human has ever thought. And for me, that just really points towards a little bit, maybe a more human humility. <laughs> Isn't <laughs> right? that fucking crazy? Like literally your iPhone gives you access to this incredible amount of knowledge. But I also think it puts us into perspective, right? Uh, the um, um, the pale blue dot idea, yeah. Carl Sagan. right? Yeah, the Carl Sagan idea that that at the end of the day, when you zoom out and really look at it, um, we can 
realize that we're special through humility as opposed to ego. You know, that thinking, mm-hmm. well, we're so smart. We're so this. We're so that. Well, AI knows everything we have ever thought or will think in every language. It can translate it back and forth. So if you could build a box, a machine to do that, were we really all that smart all along? <laughs> you know what I mean? I actually think it's, a, it's kind of a pale blue dot moment for us uh, to kind of look at uh, ourselves and gain some, some humility around it. I'm, I'm actually not in the AI doom and gloom camp at all. It's interesting. A lot of people, it, it does seem very bifurcated between doom and gloom and optimism. And there's not a lot of like, well, yeah. we'll see how it plays out sort yeah. of in the middle. Uh, I'm wondering, wh- what do your clients tend to worry about? Like, what stresses them out? Is it the same things that stress normal people out? Is it different? Is it amplified? Um, I think money uh, is an amplifier. It turns up the volume on who a person is. It doesn't change who they are. Um, with the caveat that that great wealth does have the negative effects I was, was mentioning earlier. So the, the normal worries um, that folks have, safety and security, um, this kind of a big one. They become targets for frivolous litigation and a lot of bad behavior. Um, you know, things which, if they were poor, you know, um, would never be an issue. But even the minorest of infractions are like, you know, everything's super, super litigious. And so people, this leads to the, the kind of isolating and insular thing where they, you know, they have to be careful with people because they don't know what's going on. Oh, I slipped and fell. Here's, you know. Um, so besides the security and kind of the, the, the litigation issues, there's a lot of, um, a lot of hand wrangling over what's going on in society. Um, the, the broader sort of, you know, these are, there are people who are, I feel like really concerned about it, putting their money where their mouth is and kind of thinking through these problems um, in, a, in a significant way. But yeah, people are people, right? So they, they have the basic fears, but it does kind of turn up the volume and some of the, uh, what about kids? I know some of my uh, wealthier friends who might be targets or, or what have you in sort of frivolous lawsuits or something. They um, they might allow their kids to have like an Instagram account, but it's private, it's locked, it's mm-hmm. not public. Yeah. And that sort of also uh, comes back to harm these kids in a way, right? When they go to university and they go for they go to Rush for a sorority or. Uh, now all of a sudden they've got this locked account. It it doesn't seem like they're you know we're always looking at the wrong metrics. So mm-hmm. I don't want to get into like whether we're looking at the right metrics or not. Yeah. But their life is a very closed system mm-hmm. uh, of trust. Talk to me a little bit about that and how you see it and what you've seen work and not work. And I think all parents, uh, you know, want the best for their kids. If anybody out there has a a rule book for how to get the best out of their kids. I definitely want that book. You know, I, uh, we're, we're all a trying. Um, things that I, you know, people who have raised happy, successful kids, um, you know, kind of a, some of the best examples, you know, are, I feel like are the parents who kind of let their kids be themselves and uh, been patient with them. Uh, Lord knows we all needed a lot of patience. Uh, I Not think. Me. <laughs> I think the parents or the, the kids, the, the child parent relationships that have been the most strained uh, that we've been exposed to have been those where the parents try to handle the fish a little too much. Mm. You know what I mean? Either positively or negatively. Right. Right. You, you know, you can be a helicopter parent, you know, in one direction, you can be a jerk in another direction, you know. Yeah. Um, the, the families that I know where the, you know, the kids are you know, just most normal, happiest, leading their lives. Um, the parents kind of let them be kids and let them be themselves. One thing I've heard uh, from somebody that I totally admire and respect, and I don't want to reveal who the person is, but they said, if you have wealth, how you raise your kids is their expectation. So like if you, you can't have them live a different lifestyle. So if you're living in a mansion and you get picked up in a chauffeur, and you tell your 15-year-old to go get a job at McDonald's, it's going to cause resentment. Uh, so you have to live whatever lifestyle you want them to grow up in. So mm-hmm. if you want your kids to grow up in a middle-class lifestyle, you actually have to live them. You can't force a subset of a middle-class lifestyle on them. Or how do, you, how do you see this? Like You interact with all these people. That, that is 
a truism. Um, a lot of people who have built a fortune, you'll hear something along the lines of, well, I don't want to spoil my kids. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, quote unquote, give it to them. And it leads to some really, you know, sort of interesting problems. The ones go, that you articulate. Go deeper on this. Like this is something that I know is <clears throat> top of mind for a lot of people who listen to the show, a lot of my friends. Yeah. So let's go back to our definition of success, right? So in America, this Horatio Alger, I worked hard and I made it. You know, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I, I did it. I went out there and made it, young man. And you too, you're going to go out there and make it, right? So I'm worth $10 billion. I'm going to leave you $100,000 or, or nothing at all. And you're going to go, you know, because I don't want to spoil you. Um, you know, somewhere along the lines, our definition of success also kind of blended with masculinity in this weird sort of way. And it comes to kind of define the alpha male, you know, I'm, I'm super, super successful. And if you look at Forbes, so Forbes publishes the billionaire list, 26, 2700 names on it. That's actually not the most important designation. The most important designation is self-made. Mm. So within the Forbes billionaire list, there's heirs, there's all these, but that self-made billionaire, that's the designation that everyone wants. And it leads to this sort of thing where everyone has to be self-made. Talk to any billionaire. The first words out of, out of anyone's mouth would be like, I didn't come from anything. Whether or not that's true, <laughs> right? They'll be like, oh, I came from nothing, right? That's, that's at the beginning of every story uh, on the self-made thing. And I think it... Um, it leads to some really, really interesting effects, particularly with the relation to people's children and their ability to be self-made kind of in a parent shadow. And it's not just with money. It's also with like um, what they're calling now Nepo babies. So your parents are famous actor, your parents are famous singer. Um, well, if you're interested in acting, you, you, you get opportunities. Oh, and that. then you're looked down on it. You know, it's just all of this weirdness yeah. where, of course, if a child grows up in, in, in this lifestyle, seeing this thing, maybe they want to emulate it. Maybe they don't. Um, and who doesn't want to look out for their kids and do the best for them? Um, but then when you get to the, the kind of wealth money transfer and the self-made thing, it gets kind of wonky. I can go deeper on it, but it, uh, it's kind of a touchy subject. <laughs> well, yeah, there's another aspect to sort of um, call them wealthy kids for, for lack of a better term that a lot of people don't appreciate as much as other people, which is often their parents aren't home. They're working. Mm -hmm. They're not there for them emotionally or even physically present with their kids. And that takes a toll. And maybe later in life, you, you sort of, as you, you lived unconsciously, you come to regret that. Maybe Absolutely. you don't. I mean, I, I would definitely think that that would be um, something people would regret, but it's only you sort of realize that after. And so how do we use their hindsight to become our foresight? Well, you know, on that topic, I wouldn't even point a finger at my client. I'd point a finger at myself. You know, I've been an entrepreneur, um, you know, building businesses. And, and look, you know, I, I had a day of reckoning around this very point, you know, that I'm not, I was not spending the time and the care with my own children that I should have. And, you know, listen, everything that I'm saying out here about entrepreneurs and success, I'm dealing with as a human as well. Right. And so I definitely don't want to make this, this sound like, you know, I'm exempted from it. And a lot of these learnings and the things that we're encouraging people to do, because I'm a dad of two and I've run multiple companies and sold a business and work too much and, and trying to lead a happier, balanced life myself. Uh, so, so I get it, I guess, is, a, is another reason I hope that, that we're able to, to have good conversations with folks around it. What happened? Which, your day of reckoning, like what was the, the moment or the story that you were like, whoa? Yeah, so um, in 2021, uh, kind of the worst things that I could ever imagine happening to me uh, all happened at once, like, you know, major, major life crisis. Um, and it was the sort of thing which, you know, when it happened, my life would either, my life would never be the same from the, the instance it happened. and the outcome would be binary, right? I would 
go, go on to, to be okay or, you know, or, or wind up in a very, very bad place. Going through it, I discovered that the things that were happening to me were not really happening to me. They were happening for me. And it produced this really, really incredible personal effect on me. One of the most visible effects, if you see old photos of me online, I was 350 pounds. Right? So I lost 100 pounds in about four and a half months. Um, you know, it helped me to rebuild my company, rebuild uh, and improved you know, the time I get to spend with my kids. And just all of these other things that kind of came through uh, that, that journey of the journey is, is the inward journey. Right, um, really reconnecting with and understanding one's self, and then our relation to others, and and being able to just kind of get outside of our own um, lens, our own perspective, and see ourselves uh, more honestly, more candidly. Was that the hardest moment in your life? Oh, far and away. Is there any advice you'd have for people going through something similar, where they're feeling it's the hardest moment that they're going through? Um, the advice that I would give would be to wholly face and embrace it. Don't shy away from it. Don't delay it. You know, mine was so crazy that I couldn't, <laughs> you know, I, I think I had kicked the can down the road as far as, as I could on, on, for me. And then, you know, when it happened, there was nothing that I could, could do. I had to face it. I think uh, a lot of times people will start to get the inkling, hey, something's wrong. You need to face this. Oh, and you kind of delay it. You put it off because it's uncomfortable right? to go through kind of great personal change. And, um, you know, you've, you've, t- to be free of these things, you have to defeat them. You know, whatever that is, you know, uh, addiction to food or you know, whatever these things, whatever problem it is for a person, you've got to face that thing whole on. And um, and conquer. I like that. That's good advice. I think it's fitting. We always wrap up the show with a very similar question. And given the episode and the stuff that we've talked about today, what is success for you? That's a great question. Um, you know, our, <clears throat> I've been thinking a lot about this uh, lately because you know our, our business is is growing, and um, you know a lot of really interesting things are afoot that, you know, I frankly never would have dreamed uh, would happen. And and I I feel like I dream big dreams. But, uh, you know, for me, success is um, first and foremost, being a better father, Mm -hmm. uh, my family, um, fulfilling my social responsibility and making a difference as, you know, as glib and heard it before, as that sounds. you know, I've got a book coming out and all of these other things that are going on, but, but the stuff that really, really matters is the, the heartfelt pieces for me. Um, my life has, uh, has changed a lot in that regard. Um, I love what I get to do every day, uh, being able to work with the folks that we work with. And I really do feel like we're making a difference, uh, not only uh, in the lives of our clients, but in the lives of everyone that we touch. 